Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be able to speak here. Um, so uh, as you all know, the, according to the theory of inflation, primordial fluctuations were produced by quantum mechanical effects in the early universe. Of course, the fluctuations we now see are classical. And the theory behind this is extremely simple. So each, uh, we have the, the, the inflation is approximated by this the Sitter space time. This pointer doesn't seem to work. If there is another pointer, that would be great. Um, and then uh, we, take, we take all the fluctuations, we Fourier decompose them, and then each Fourier mode uh, has, is governed by a Lagrangian, which is simply the Lagrangian of a harmonic oscillator, except that its uh, mass is time dependent. Or otherwise, you can say that the h bar is time dependent in such a way that uh, h bar is going to zero at the end of inflation or is the oscillator is becoming more and more classical. So uh, you can see this very explicitly, explicitly by computing the commutation relations between the, um, the amplitude of the wave for each particular mode and its, time, its proper time derivative, and it suddenly goes to zero as the mode uh, becomes bigger, the physical length, wavelength becomes bigger than the Hubble scale during inflation. Um, now, um, th this results in the fact that uh, at reheating, so by the time the universe is reheated, for all these uh, modes that we'll ever observe, uh, we basically uh, are going to have a classical probability distribution. And in fact, so in fact, we don't measure actually the conjugate momentum. We don't even, uh, in practice, uh, for measure even the time derivative, which as we said, even that goes to zero, the commutator goes to zero. So in the end, we are uh, having a classical distribu probability distribution for the shape of the curvature of the universe at reheating. Okay. Um, now, one question we would like to ask is whether we can distinguish this classical probability distribution that was produced for us by quantum mechanics from a classical probability distribution that could have been produced by other processes during inflation. Let's say some, something was going on or inflation generating some thermal distribution of particles or some other uh, classical process, which is not quantum mechanical. Um, now, how do we uh, distinguish this in ordinary quantum mechanics? So in ordinary quantum mechanics, we can test quantum mechanics by testing many of uh, its successful predictions, like energy levels in atoms, uh, you know, G minus two, et cetera. Um, but the test that tells us that there is a, a fundamental deviation from classical physics is the Bell inequality. So Bell inequalities is uh, the test that most clearly shows you that you have something you cannot possibly reproduce using classical physics. Um, and so a quick uh, reminder of Bell inequalities. So you imagine you have a system that uh, consists of a pair of spins, uh, which starts in an entangled state, let's say the spin singlet state. And then uh, on, one of the, um, on one of the sides, you choose to measure one observable, either A or A prime. And you think of these observables as being the uh, sigma dot n, where n is the direction in space and sigma is the poly matrices. So all of these are operators that have eigenvalues plus or minus one. Um, and a and n prime means two different uh, directions in, in space. And similarly, you do the same on the second spin. So you measure b and b prime. And then you consider various correlations. And you can, um, sometimes you can measure a and b. So you measure a on one side, b on the other side. Sometimes you measure A and B prime, and so on. And you form uh, the statistics. You measure the, the correlation, uh, correlations of all these observables. And you can show that uh, if uh, the laws of the physics uh, originated from some hidden variables that uh, were subject to the principle of causality, the principle of uh, special relativity, that you cannot propagate signals faster than light, then if we measure, we make the decision to measure either B or B prime in the right, the statistics of uh, A and A prime uh, are going to be independent of that choice. Uh, so uh, in that classical model, which is given here by uh, this line over here, um, um, well, it, you can rewrite the observable in this way. And then uh, if, uh, let's say, independently of what, whether I choose A or A prime, the distributions of B and B prime are determined by the hidden variables. And for each configuration of the hidden variables, B and B prime are either plus or minus 1. And so either the first term uh, is 0 or the second term uh, is 0. And the term that is non-zero has a maximal value, which is plus or minus 2. Okay? And those terms are independent of where I choose A and A prime. So, um, so we get that the maximal uh, possible expectation value in, according to classical hidden variables is 2. 
Well, in quantum mechanics, uh, you can show that the maximum value is uh, 2 times square root of 2, so it's bigger. Um, and that you can show easily by taking uh, this uh, operator and you take the square of the operator. And so the square of each of the pieces is equal to 1. Um, so A and B commute with each other, of course. But then there is a piece that you get from the various uh, cross products that you can write as uh, A commutator A prime times B commutator B prime. And the crucial point that in quantum mechanics, these operators don't commute imply that uh, this C square can have eigenvalues which are bigger than 4. So when you take the square root, you get something bigger than 2. Um, now, in cosmology, as we said, the only observables we observe are all these uh, positions of these harmonic oscillators. They're all commuting. So at first sight, it seems that there is, we just uh, cannot do the same. And we certainly cannot do the same. Um, so in other words, um, so if the analogy we're trying to make is that, uh, so we, we have uh, in, the, in the Bell case, we had a common origin for the particles. And then at space like separated regions, we measure A or A or A prime or B or B prime. So in cosmology, we have something similar. We have uh, an, a common origin for everything. We have a unique initial state. And then uh, we have causally separated regions during reheating. And we could imagine measuring A and A well, we could imagine doing measurements, but they're all A's. There are no A and A primes. Therefore, it doesn't work. Uh, but then uh, we can think of it slightly differently. So we can think that uh, this, this point where we make the measurement, so in the Bell experiment, there is a time at which we imagine the measurement uh, having happened, or that we're, we do the measurement. And we can imagine that time as happening uh, earlier in the universe. So we have the reheating surface, and then we go back in uh, time to some early time. And so we imagine these fluctuations that have a common origin. And then there is some self-measurement of the fluctuations that we'll have to discuss in more detail. And then uh, so that things become classical uh, already in the early universe. And we saw that the fluctuations are becoming classical as they cross the horizon. So we can really think of uh, this happening. Uh, and then we have the late early universe reheating and the signals coming to us. And in this way, we can really uh, have something that looks a little more like a Bell inequality if we imagine that the measurement occurred earlier. Um, of course, if we put this boundary between quantum to classical um, at very uh, late times. For example, even in the Bell case, if we put that boundary very close to where the observer sits, um, where the signals are getting from these two experiments that measure the spins, then we also don't have any Bell inequality. So everything that this guy measures uh, is uh, purely classical um, and, and commuting. OK, so uh, just uh, to convince you that there could be uh, such a measurement, um, we'll just choose a universe that will make it easy. So this will not, um, so we are not claiming that this is the model for the early universe. Uh, so it's not, we're not going to claim that this. We are just simply going to choose a model for the early universe where Bell inequalities can be tested with primordial fluctuations. Uh, and so uh, we'll just design a universe that makes it easy. We basically will build all the uh, features of uh, the Bell experiment in this universe. Um, so, and so the idea is uh, imagine a universe where besides having the inflaton, we have three other massless fields. We form an isospin triplet. So isospin is just internal SO3 symmetry uh, during inflation. Um, and in such a way that this, uh, this field uh, exists during the early universe and survives till till today. So it has some imprint, leave some imprint in the distribution of galaxies, whatever, that uh, we could measure in principle today. So we imagine this, of course. Uh, um, so if we looked at the universe in the skies, be beside the, besides the usual uh, picture we saw at the beginning, uh, we would also have, at each region in the sky, we'll assign a, an arrow, a direction that is the direction in which this isospin triplet field points. Um, then, in addition, we'll assume that there are uh, massive uh, particles that are isospin um, doublets that get created during inflation. And they get created at some particular time during inflation because perhaps they were very massive. They became light, and then they become massive again. Um, and then uh, these uh, particles get created, and they decay. And when they decay, they decay in a way that depends on uh, the relative spin projection of the uh, isospin doublet and the triplet uh, background fields. And they decay into ordinary curvature fluctuations. And, um, and they decay in a way that uh, they create a disturbance, which has high signal, local high signal to noise ratio, uh, so that you can get a new pattern of non-Gaussianities, which is uh, 
visible event by event. So this is uh, the, what we assume, and if we assume, make all these assumptions, uh, this is the picture of roughly what we would see in the sky. So we see the uh, some effect of the isospin triplet that we see today. And then in the uh, pattern of primordial uh, fluctuations, we would see uh, regions that de deviate from Gaussianity. And there are regions which deviate from Gaussianity in one way, so let's say the red dots, and regions that deviate from Gaussianity in uh, some other ways. So one could be give rise to a large, let's say, four-point function, and the other one could give rise to a large five-point function, for example. Um, those are the regions. And then uh, the idea is that we interpret this as a measurement that occurred in the early universe. So for example, here, um, well, unfortunately, this pointer doesn't work. But let's say we take a pair, this pair. Um, it doesn't matter with that pointer. So we take this pair. This is a pair of particles that was produced during the beginning of inflation that then decay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I have the quality of not being able to work point. Anyway, I. <laughs> oh, the, the first one. OK, very good. So, um, so the idea is that here, um, so the arrow here determines, is analogous to the n, right? The direction along which the detect the measurement apparatus is pointing. Uh, and so this is measuring the spin of this particle along this direction. And the result is, let's say, minus 1. That's what green is. And here, we are pointing along, let's say, the same direction. In this case, the arrow points along the same direction. And the result is also uh, happens to be uh, minus 1. So in, um, and in some other case, uh, we also measured along various directions. And the result in this case was plus 1. In this case, was minus 1. And in this case, you can uh, then, out of all this data, you can select the configuration of arrows which were like A and A prime. That would be a subset of all this data. And then form the correlations in the, in the, uh, in the Bell inequality and, and get uh, confirmation that this could not have been produced uh, uh, using classical physics. If you make the assumption that by the time these guys decayed, these two were causally disconnected. So you have to make this extra assumption that we'll always have to do when we do the Bell experiment. Um, so. Um, oh, this is what I was uh, explaining before. So uh, we look at the, uh, at the direction the field is pointing. That we can see in the sky. And this is a local deviation from Gaussianity that is of one type or another type. And this reduces to the measurements of these uh, spin projections. Um, and then we find the, the, the pairs and we form the inequalities. Okay. Um, now. Uh, of course, this is a very weird model for the early universe. But if our own universe right now is undergoing a period of inflation, and let's say it's slow roll inflation, w is different than minus 1, um, and the, the universe were to reheat and so on, that's how the observers in the further universe, very late, far future, will see our Bell experiments. Okay? So they will think it's a crazy universe, but well, no. Um, but anyway, our goal is not to describe those late observers, but us. And so one, something that would be nice, and I don't know how to do it precisely, is to do something like this uh, with only curvature fluctuations. So the, only the curvature fluctuations we see, and somehow use them to uh, think about some complicated observable, some more sophisticated observable, where the curvature fluctuations self-measure themselves. And in this way, uh, find something of that kind. Now, some intermediate goals uh, could be to understand this purely with curvature and gravity fluctuations, or perhaps curvature fluctuations, and you postulate the existence of other, perhaps, particles, which perhaps exist during inflation. And using them, maybe we can uh, get this goal. And we could also sometimes, uh, so there was a, a sharp, uh, an important uh, assumption that we had in the previous discussion, which was the idea that each spin was very sharply measured. And that's an important feature of uh, the well discussion. And we could drop that too. Uh, and then just some uh, measure, something, some kind of interference patterns, kind of two slit experiment uh, ideas. And this you can do if uh, you think, uh, if you have massive uh, spinning particles during inflation. So, it's just the, um, so here we postulate the existence of an extra massive spinning particle, which might exist during inflation with a mass of order of the Hubble scale. And if those masses uh, existed, um, then, if those particles existed, then it is possible that uh, we might be able to see in uh, three-point functions the uh, effects of these uh, particles. 
And um, we see a kind of interference effect in the three-point function, which is proportional to the cosine of the angle between the uh, short mo the momenta corresponding to short distances and the uh, long distance. So we look at the particular limit of the three-point function, where um, the Fourier momenta are very large for two of them. Uh, that means these are two points that are very close to each other. And the third momentum, uh, which is small, that's a longer distance. Um, and then uh, we get um, the characteristic uh, Legendre polynomials that correspond to the correlations between spins. And uh, this is, again, uh, one of the correlators we have in the th this type of spin experiments. Um, very good. So um, this doesn't have all the features of the uh, Bell experiment, but it has some of the features. And it some, would be further evidence of um, quantum mechanical effects. So I think perhaps uh, we were tasked with the idea of predicting what the future in five years. So perhaps in five years, we'll understand perhaps more sophisticated experiments where we can actually do test the uh, Bell inequalities in a sharper way uh, using cosmological observables and will be theoretically constructed. And is it going to be uh, possible to measure them experimentally? Almost for sure, not in the next five years, um, but perhaps in 30 years. And everyone says that the big hope is the 21 centimeter tomography. Um, but, um, well, we'll see what happens. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Great. Okay. Questions? Comments? Yeah, Eva. Oops, excuse me. Um, so, mm -hmm. it is a logical possibility that Mm -hmm. uh, the proximate cause of the perturbations is classical yes. radiation emanating from sources that are produced quantum mechanically. Yeah. And uh, I'm being mm -hmm. slow. Does your mm -hmm. diagnostic test that as opposed to the standard vacuum fluctuations? Uh, the, the diagnostic, this bell story? Sorry? Yeah. yeah, it does. It yeah. does. It would test yeah. the difference. Yeah, it would, it would be impossible to get these correlations. So the, if in this toy universe, so th this was true in the toy universe, right? Are we, this is a question about the toy universe where we really had the sharp. Uh, so in this toy universe, you could not produce this, the patterns with the correct statistics. If you assume that uh, you have to make one assumption, which is that uh, when these particles decay, they were out of uh, causal contact, which you can somehow. Um, this is the underlying assumption that distance scales correspond to time. So if you make this assumption that distance scales correspond to time, uh, then you conclude that these two uh, particles due to their di to their distance uh, were causally separated when those fluctuations were produced, then you conclude it's uh, definitely not not classical at the time. So, oh, is that, is that testing uh, quantum nature of the spin triplet? Suddenly for double it. But what this is spin triplet fluctuation? The uh, nature well, of that. Th this is this is testing the quantum nature of the the spins of these extra massive particles yes. that we postulated. Yes. Yeah, that's right. yeah, it, right. Yeah, Andre. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, is, is there any uh, relation whatsoever between what you are doing and what people were discussing many years ago? Mm -hmm. At some stage, uh, Neil Turk suggested an idea that mm -hmm. you can redistribute some very specific, uh, mm -hmm. well, uh, defects on the sky. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about textures, yeah. but something else mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. sky mm -hmm. so that it would mimic all of these peaks in CMB observations mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. And then after W map mm -hmm. have found mm -hmm. an undercorrelation between uh, mm -hmm. normal adiabatic perturbations and polarization, mm -hmm. this mechanism when you specifically adjust stuff right. in the right. beginning, right. this was ruled out. Right. Okay. Is there any relation between this or not? Because people were trying to do something like mm -hmm. what inf uh, inflation and perturbations do right. by classical something. And right, right, right. Well, the, of course, you can rule out specific models. The, the beauty of the Bell inequalities is that they rule out all models. So we're, we're trying to find something that would rule out all models. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that if you, if you think about specific models, you run into difficulties very quickly. So already, uh, this last thing I was discussing, uh, so getting these Legendre polynomials from a classical model is, is, is very difficult. We, we tried and uh, we, we didn't succeed, but well, maybe there is a way to get them uh, from a classical model. Um. Any other questions, comments? 
Do you still see this, this as, even if it's mm -hmm. a slow roll, a Gaussian regime, yeah. can you imagine something like this can be done in, in, in that? Non-Gaussianity would be probably. Well, I think, I think again, so in the, in the far future, so it, it all depends on what our experimental colleagues can do. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so maybe in uh, 30 years, we have these huge precise maps of 21 centimeter tomography. We, for some reason, we're extremely lucky, and we can see a huge number of modes, and then many of these things will be possible. But uh, you know, theoretically, it's easy to consider these things, and uh, it's it's fun, and I think it uh, it, it might. Uh, I mean, it, it's interesting to understand even conceptually how you would do this. Uh, okay, great, thank you, and one, and let's thank all the speakers in the session.